Good morning and welcome to Calvary Community Church here at 4811 George Road in Tampa, Florida. It's nice to see our guests this morning. I'm sorry for the occasion of your visit, but I'm glad you came here. Thank you. Jace, good to see you. Zach, I'm glad your teacher's coming back, but I'm glad you're here today. That's nice. We're going to have our Sunday school lesson like we did last week, instead of out of the Bible so much, out of the hymn book. And the screens, you see Ephesians 5, 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for the, all things unto God and the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is a good thing to sing songs to the Lord and to yourselves among one another. It, it's all plural there. We're all speaking and singing and making melody your not thy, but your is plural. Everybody's involved. So let's pray. Father in heaven, as we open this book that goes next to the Bible in our church pews, and we pray you'll, you'll guide us and show us and help us learn interesting things that shed light on your word and will remind us of how good you are. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm using a book besides our hymn book. Our hymn book is a great book. I went through for, I don't know, 20 or 30 minutes last Sunday morning, all the features of this hymn book, which is called Praise, Our Songs and Hymns. And we went and looked at the indices in the back and how to find things and how to use it more profitably. But I have another book written, compiled more, to, more than written, by a man named Al Smith, who for some time was called the Dean of Gospel Music. And this book is not about Al Smith. It's his collection of stories behind the hymns. And I have only got through two or three of them last week, but I think it was just fun to hear this man who lived in a previous millennium even. <laughs> he, he's still been on the radio here, though he died some decades ago, uh, because they replayed this, his telling of hymn stories on the local Christian radio for a good while. I'd like you to turn in your hymn book, if you have one there in the pew in front of you, to number 393, the hymn called My Faith Looks Up to Thee. And this is the story Al Smith tells about this. After the American Revolution, the theological climate of America changed considerably. It became popular to adapt views of disbelief in the Bible, the deity of Christ, and to scoff at religion as superstition. Intemperance, profanity, gambling, and licentiousness were common. But God, in his perfect planning and undying love, caused the second great awakening, which, as it swept across our country, overflowed its bounds and many Unconcerned, unbelieving college students became new creatures in Christ. One such student was Ray Palmer. If you look at that hymn book at the top of the left corner of that page, it says Ray Palmer, the writer of the poem, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. After Ray Palmer graduated from Yale in the fall of 1830, he became a teacher in New York City. One evening, while alone in his rooms, he began to review the wonder of God's love and its effect upon his young life. In the hush and solemnity of that moment, he penned these beautiful words of testimony and assurance. He carefully copied the six stanza text in a small leather book he carried, this for his own use, for he had not the slightest idea that it would be used to anyone else. Sometime later, while visiting in Boston, he was met on the street by Dr. Lowell Mason, that's the author of the music, who asked him if he might have any hymns he could submit for a hymn and tune book, which he was compiling with Dr. Hastings of New York. Ray Palmer showed the poem, My Faith, to Dr. Mason, who copied it and took it with him. Two or three days later, they met again on the street. Dr. Mason exclaimed in greeting, Mr. Palmer, you may live to do many great things, but I feel that you will be known best as the author of My Faith Looks Up to Thee. Now, I don't know that this is a familiar tune to you. If it is, I'd love you to sing it. I'm going to try to sing this for us right now. It only has in our hymn book four stanzas, and I don't know that we'll do all of those. My faith looks up to thee, 
Thou Lamb of Calvary, Savior divine, now hear me while I pray, take all my guilt away, oh, let me from this day be holy thine. Excuse me for the distraction, we'll kill that. May thy rich grace impart strength to my fainting heart, my zeal inspire. Now, as thou hast died for me, oh, may my love to thee pure form and changeless be a living fire. And the, all four verses are good, but I have another story to tell you, so let us, let us go on to an author who I really do. Every time I see one of her songs, I just think, that's the best, and then I see another one, and then, no, that's the best. Page 436 in the hymn book, there is no best. <laughs> There's no favorite. Francis Ridley Havergal. I gave my life for thee. <sighs> she wrote to a friend, yes, I gave my life for thee as mine, and perhaps it will interest you to know how nearly it went into the fire instead of all over the world. The friend had asked the authorship of the song. I'll let her continue her story. She said, I was 23 at the time and was visiting friends in Germany. I had been sightseeing and was very tired. I was staying as a guest in the home of a well-known pastor. On the wall of his home was a picture of the crucifixion with the words, I gave my life for thee, written underneath it. Earlier in my visit, I had noticed this painting, but its significance had not gotten hold of me. This day I sat down and looked at it intently. I reread the words, I gave my life for thee. And then it seemed as if I heard a voice asking, What hast thou given for me? Immediately in a flash the words came to me. I scribbled them in a few minutes on the back of a circular I had in my purse. I read them over and thought, Well, this is not worthwhile poetry anyway, so I won't bother to write it out on paper. I then thought, well, I keep it at all. So I threw it into the burning fire in the fireplace. Somehow it did not ignite, but fell out onto the hearth. As I saw it there, a sudden impulse made me pick it up. It was crumpled and singed, but I put it in my purse. Some days later, when I was back in England, I went to see an old woman in the poor house. She began talking to me about her Savior, as she always did. I thought I would see if she, a simple woman, would care for these verses, which I felt sure were of no value to anyone. I read them to her, and to my delight and surprise, she was so pleased that she requested a copy for herself. This I gave her, and soon I was sending copies of it in all directions. This hymn proved to be the first of many written by Miss Havergal, the first one she wrote. Some of her others are I am trusting thee, Lord Jesus, who is on the Lord's side, O Savior, precious Jesus, Savior, and take my life and let it be. But this is her first. The music was written by one of the two men that worked so closely with the Almudi, Philip Bliss, and this is the song. I gave my life for thee, my precious blood I shed that thou might ransom me and quicken from the dead i gave i gave my life for thee what hast thou given for me i gave i gave my life for thee what hast thou given for me just as a tiny bit of musical instruction, when you come to a place where that bold line and slender line 
is at the end and the beginning of the staff, and there's two little dots after it and before it, that means you repeat that line before you go on to the next verse. My Father's house of light, my glory circled throne, I left for earthly night, for wandering sad and lone. I left, I left it all for thee, as thou left art for me. I left, I left it all for thee, as thou left art for me. I suffered much for thee, more than thy tongue can tell. Of bitterest agony to rescue thee from hell. I've borne, I've borne it all for thee. What hast thou borne for me? I've borne, I've borne it all for thee. What hast thou borne for me? <coughs> And I have brought to thee down from my home above salvation full and free, my pardon and my love. I bring, I bring rich gifts to thee. What hast thou brought to me? I bring, I bring rich gifts to thee. What hast thou brought to me? It reminds me, although it's leaning heavily on the person listening to all that the Savior has done for them, it reminds me of Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus on two good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. We go on to another, number 408 in the hymn book, 408. The author's name is Elisha. Hoffman, and he wrote both words and music. It was while he was a pastor in Lebanon, Pennsylvania, that the Reverend Elijah A. Hoffman wrote, I must tell Jesus. On the membership roll of the church was a lady who just seemed to be full of sorrows and trials all the time. Because of this, Reverend Hoffman made a determined effort to visit with her more often than the others in the church, for he sensed her need of the prayer and the reading of the Bible which accompanied each of his visits. This did much to lift her spirits and lighten her load. Coming into her home one day, he found that a new calamity had befallen her, and she was crestfallen and oh so discouraged. As she bun unburdened her heart to her pastor, and as she told him what had happened, she would wring her hands and exclaim, Oh, Brother Hoffman, what shall I do? What shall I do? When she had finished her tale of woe, Pastor Hoffman opened the Bible and began to quote verses of assurance, trust, and the faithfulness of God. After he had read a few of them, he remarked, You see, my dear sister, God wants to bear all of these sorrows, whether great or small. The best thing we can do is to take them to Jesus. We must tell Jesus. For a moment there was silence, and then with face aglow and her eyes shining, she exclaimed, Yes, Pastor, you are so right. I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus. Pastor Hoffman said that he made no further pastoral calls that day, for his, in his heart was burning the phrase, I must tell Jesus. He knew it was a message the whole world should know, and what better way to send it forth than with a song. He went back to his church study and wrote, I must tell Jesus that very afternoon. I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. 
In my distress he kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for his own. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. And the other two verses are just as good. It is a good song. Have you some burdens today? There's a place you can tell them. There's a place you can tell them. There's kind of a theme song here at Calvary Community Church. The theme song is number 524 in this hymn book. And I know it was just one that Dr. Lindstrom liked, liked so much that I think that might be where the name Calvary Community Church came from. The original name of this church when it began was Community Presbyterian Church. But it was at a time when the name Presbyterian got linked with the World Council of Churches. And it was an independent little congregational church, but they had a name that Dr. Lindstrom wasn't comfortable with. And so very quickly, to avoid the connection with the World Council of the United Presbyterian Church, the name was changed to Calvary Community Church. And I think this song, number 524, was part of the reason, because he did like this song. This gospel song of testimony, which is enjoyed by so many and is one of my favorites, Dr. Smith said, would not have been written had it not been for a concerned father and a Bible school official who made an exception to the rules because he felt God wanted him to do so. I'll let Dr. R.A. Torrey tell the story as he told it in a Torrey Alexander meeting in Birmingham, England in 1905. When I, Tory said, was president of the Moody Bible Institute, I received a letter from a very concerned pastor father who told me of a son who was causing himself and his family a great deal of trouble. His life was really mixed up, and the father felt that the only thing that could help would be if his son would be under the daily teaching of the Bible as well as Christian fellowship with other young people. I at first advised the father that even though I sympathized with him, for I too was a father, yet because I was running a Bible school and not a reform school, I had to deny his request. The broken-hearted father contacted me immediately upon receipt of my reply and again pleaded his son's cause. This time, Tory said, I capitulated with the stipulation that the son was to see me every day and that he would make every effort to abide by the rules and requirements of the institute. If he failed in any of these terms, I would have to ask him to leave. The son came, and at first it seemed almost hopeless. Never have I met someone with so many problems, and particularly in the spiritual realm. He did, however, abide by the rules as he had promised. As I look back, I feel that this was his first step to recovery. But each day as he came... He would reveal by his questions the turmoil and raging turbulence which was almost tearing him apart. Each day I would answer his questions with God's word. I felt that this would do more than all of the human reasoning I might be able to give. The days became weeks, the weeks became months, and though some improvement seemed to have been made, yet there was not the total deliverance for which we prayed. One day he came in with his face aglow like the rain on parched ground. God had answered our prayer for his needs. From that time on, he became an exemplary student, and today in our country, he is one of our fine Bible teachers. His name is William R. Newell. Dr. Smith goes on to say, It is my privilege to know Dr. Newell personally, and he confirmed all that Dr. Torrey had said, but then he added, you know, Al, if I hadn't gone through that experience, and may I assure you it wasn't pleasant at the time, I perhaps never would have come to know the importance of God's word and the wonderful truth of salvation by grace, that my place had been taken at Calvary by God's only begotten Son. 
It was one day as I was rejoicing in the reality of this that I decided I would write it out as a poem, more or less giving an account of God's leading in my life. I thought how I gave little thought to the gospel, but how through Dr. Torrey and his faithfulness in presenting God's word as the answer to my problems, I realized I was a sinner and had to come God's way. There followed the wonderful day when I surrendered my all, that wonderful day when I came rushing into Dr. Torrey's office to tell him. It was then I decided that the poem needed one more stanza, and so, led by the Holy Spirit, I am sure I wrote, Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. As I read what I had written, I realized that this was not only a a word picture of what had happened in my life, but could also apply to many more in the family of God. I was at that time teaching at the Moody Bible Institute, and so with a copy of the poem in my hand, I made my way to the office of Dr. D.B. Towner, who was the head of the music department and also a well-known composer of gospel music. I hoped that perhaps he might find the poem good enough to write some music for it. I met him in the hallway and handed it to him and then went on to a class I was teaching. After teaching the class, I was on my way back to my office when Dr. Towner met me and said, Bill, I was so taken with the poem you gave me that I immediately went to my studio and composed a tune. I feel that it could be the best song that either of us will ever write in our lifetime. And as you know, Al, continued Newell, I don't know how much merit my song has as far as literary value is concerned, but I'll tell you one thing. That song has affected more people around the world than the many books God has permitted me to write. God is good, isn't he? I think you know this song. I hope you'll sing it. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified. Knowing not it was for me, he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. By God's word at last my sin I learned. Then I trembled at the law I'd spurned. Till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. And the last, oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty God that God did span at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Amen. Well, that one I wanted to get to. Another song in our hymn book is number 479. Many of the songs are about going to heaven. Not all of them, but many of them are. This one especially so. Face to face, based on 1 Corinthians 13, 12. I don't know if these will come back on or not. Maybe. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12. Now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now also I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Amen. The story of this song, the melody of this wonderful song went through an experience similar to the melody of, by William Bradbury that is now used with Charlotte Elliott's words, Just As I Am. 
Most melodies were first written for a different set of, set of words. Here is the story of Face to Face. Grant Colfax Tuller was holding meetings in Rutherford, New Jersey in 1898. He decided he would introduce something new for the Sunday evening service and so quickly jotted down a melody and a set of words that had been forming in his mind for several days. It was entitled, All for Me the Savior Suffered. All for me the Savior suffered. He played it on the piano for the pastor, Charles L. Mead, and asked him to sing it that evening. The people were blessed by the new song and were very pleased that a new song had been introduced in their church. At that time, I'm sure neither they nor the composer felt that it would set the world on fire, but a letter Brother Tuller received the next day changed all of this. It was a letter from a Mrs. Frank Breck, and in it she had enclosed some poems for him to put to music. As he looked over the poems, one of them caught his eye. It was entitled Face to Face. As Mr. Tuller reviewed the words, he found that they fitted exactly to the melody he had written the day before. Without a moment's hesitation, he said to himself, these words convey a stronger message with my tune than my own. I'll use these, for I feel God will bless the words to many hearts. And bless them God did. From the day when it first appeared in print in 1898 until now, face to face has been a favorite of pilgrim hearts around the world. This is number 479. Face to face with Christ my Savior, face to face what will it be? When with rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ who died for me. Face to face I shall behold him far beyond the starry sky. Face to face in all his glory I shall see him by and by. Only faintly now I see him with the darkling veil between. But a blessed day is coming when his glory shall be seen. Face to face I shall behold him far beyond the starry sky. Face to face in all his glory, I shall see him by and by. But rejoicing in his presence, when our banished grief and pain, when the crooked ways are straightened, and the dark things shall be plain. Face to face I shall behold him far beyond the starry sky. Face to face in all his glory I shall see him by and by. Face to face O oh, blissful moment, face to face to see and know, face to face with my Redeemer, Jesus Christ, who loves me so. Face to face I shall behold him far beyond the starry sky. Face to face in all his glory, I shall see him by and by. Another verse or two come to mind when I read those words. In 1 John chapter 3, 
John writes, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now, now are we the sons of God. It doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. I think that's just really good. Page 329 in our hymn book, page 329, a song called Anywhere with Jesus. The theme for this song came to Dr. D.B. Towner as he was listening to a message given by D.L. Moody. It was in Birmingham, Binghamton, New York in 1866. It was one of the first meetings in which Dr. Towner was associated with Mr. Moody. It was also one of the first songs he wrote. Mr. Moody's sermon was filled with the challenge that with Christ as the captain of one's life, you can go anywhere without fear, for God would see you through. He drew his illustrations from the Bible and introduced Daniel in the lion's den, the Hebrew children in the fiery furnace, the Apostle Paul and others. Moody made them come to life, mused Towner. There ought to be a song written with that theme. Usually a writer of that time would first secure the words before attempting a melody, but he decided he would write the melody first and try to put, it, put into it the special feeling he felt was needed for such a song. After he had completed the music, he sent it on to Cleveland, Ohio. There lived a young lady named Jessie Brown who had a God-given gift for writing sacred poems. With the song, Dr. Mr. Towner included a note telling Miss Brown that he wanted the song to say, Anywhere with Jesus... As Miss Brown played the music, she was able to catch the spirit in which Mr. Towner had written it, and in a very short time had written a set of words making Anywhere with Jesus a complete song. Soon the Sunday schools and Christian Endeavor societies had made it their most popular gospel song. In 1896, Jessie Brown became the wife of Reverend John E. Pounds, and it's because of this that the name Jesse Brown Pounds is usually found on her songs. Number 329, the first verse. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere he leads me in this world below. Anywhere without him dearest joys would fade. Anywhere with Jesus I am not afraid. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere with Jesus I am not alone. Other friends may fail me, he is still my own. Though his hand may lead me over dreary ways, Anywhere with Jesus is a house of praise. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. That's a good peppy song. We're almost through our hour here. But there's another kind of song in here. Another kind of song. Number... 469 is Beyond the Sunset. But I need to read you a story about another song taken from this same picture, the sunset. The one on page 469 is written by Virgil Brock and Blanche Brock, the words and music, Beyond the Sunset. It's a good song. Haldor Lenenas and Virgil Brock wrote both songs entitled Beyond the Sunset. W.C. Poole wrote Sunrise Tomorrow. John W. Peterson wrote Over the Sunset Mountains. All wonderful and graphic ways of describing heaven, that beautiful place our blessed Lord has prepared for them that love and serve him. 
Somewhere in the life of a composer, he will eventually write a song on his theme, which never seems to grow old, and so it was not at all unusual that one day as I viewed the western sky tinted in colors that only God could paint, I exclaimed, how wonderful, and yet the Lord has told me that he is preparing a place and a life so beautiful for me that no human eyes have seen anything to compare with it. No description man ever gave with words could truthfully picture it. No man, no matter how vivid his imagination, could ever envision the wonderful things that God has prepared for his children. Dr. Smith said, I felt inspired to translate into a song which I had experienced in those few but exciting moments. It was called Beyond God's Sunset. Beyond God's Sunset is not in our hymn book, so I'll not trouble you with that. But I think it was nice. Often when I sing this song, I use the following letter instead of the story. It was written by Dr. Harry Rimmer who is a cherished friend and one of the most inspiring and challenging Bible teachers and conference speakers of the last generation. He was always a favorite of young people because he had a wonderful way of making the Bible live. Dr. Rimmer was also a scientist and archaeologist in his own right, and his informative lectures on science and the Bible have long been remembered. Dr. Rimmer spent his last year in California where he had gone to live after a diagnosis he had terminal cancer. Each Sunday, he listened on the radio to his good friend in the bonds of the gospel, Dr. Charles E. Fuller of the Old Fashioned Revival Hour. One broadcast, Dr. Fuller advised his audience that on the next Sunday, he would speak on his favorite sun subject, heaven. After the broadcast, Dr. Rimmer wrote Dr. Fuller the following letter. My dear Charlie, next Sunday, you are to talk about heaven. I am interested in that land because I have a clear title to a bit of property there for over 50 years. I did not buy it, for it was given to me without money and without price. But the donor purchased it for me at a tremendous cost. I'm not holding it for speculation, for the deed is not transferable. It is not a vacant lot, for I've been sending materials there for over 50 years out of which the greatest architecture and builder of the universe has been building a home for me which will suit me perfectly and will never need to be repaired. Termites cannot undermine its foundations, for it rests upon the rock of ages. Fire cannot destroy it. Floods cannot wash it away. No locks or bolts will ever be placed upon its doors, for no devious person can ever enter that land where my dwelling stands, almost completed it is ready for me to enter in and rest in peace eternally without fear of being ejected. There is a valley of deep shadow between the place where I live in California and that to which I shall journey in a short time. I cannot reach my home in that city of gold without passing through this dark valley of shadows. But I am not afraid because the best friend I ever had went through the same valley long ago and drove away its gloom. He has stuck with me through thick and thin since we first became acquainted 55 years ago, and I hold his promise in printed form never to forsake me nor to leave me alone. He will be with me as I walk through the valley of the shadows, and I will not lose my way when he is with me. I hope to hear your sermon on Sunday next from my home here, but I have no assurance that I shall. My ticket to heaven has no date stamped upon it, no return coupon, and no permit for baggage. I am all ready to go, and I may not be here when you are talking next Sunday. But if not, I shall meet you there someday. Harry Rimmer. This letter was placed upon the deck, uh, desk of Dr. Fuller the next Wednesday. By that time, Dr. Rimmer was already in that land, which is fairer than day the land that he had seen by faith for over 50 years. This is number 469 in our hymn book, Beyond the Sunset. Beyond the Sunset. I want to tell you, Harry Rimmer, I never had the privilege of seeing him in person. I'm not that old. But I have him on tape, and I've heard stories about him. In his age, he sometimes stood in front of a group and told them to turn to a passage in the New Testament. And he'd say, we'll read this, and he'd open his Bible and say he was reading it. But somebody on the platform behind him noticed he was holding his Bible upside down. 
He was reading it perfectly, but from memory, not from his Bible. He just didn't want to appear to be showing off. Harry Rimmer knew the book. He was one of the ones I've read about and heard that loved the gospel as we love it, the clarity and the simplicity of the gospel. I'll tell you more stories. This is page 469, written by Virgil Brock. <coughs> Beyond the sunset, O blissful morning, when with our Savior amnes begun, earth's toiling ended, O glorious dawning, beyond the sunset, when day is done. Beyond the sunset, no clouds will gather, no storms will threaten, no fears annoy. O oh, day of gladness, O oh, day unending, beyond the sunset, eternal joy beyond the sunset a hand will guide me to god the father whom i adore his glorious presence his words of welcome will be my portion on that fair shore. Beyond the sunset, O oh, glad reunion, with our dear Savior, our dear loved ones who've gone before, in that fair homeland, We'll know no parting beyond the sunset forevermore. I hope you'll forgive my failings there. One more verse, one last verse, and we'll be done for the morning of this part of our worship service. John chapter 14. The disciples were troubled. The disciples were gathered with the Lord Jesus in the upper room, and he had told them he was leaving. He was not going to be with them anymore. They were very discouraged, and he spoke these words to them in that time of discouragement. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And the way or, whither I go, you know, and the way you know. One of the disciples spoke up. We make fun of him, call him Doubting Thomas sometimes, but he asked questions that we are so glad were asked so that we hear the answer. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. How can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way. I'm the road. I'm the highway. I'm the truth. I'm the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. That's all there is. You don't need another way. There is no other way. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, Peter was preaching this truth. Peter who had been there, and they told him to stop it. Stop that preaching in Jesus. And he said, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. None other name. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the songs of our, of our songbook and the songs of the Bible. 
and the times we can think through them and hear their stories and be encouraged, especially by the words of Jesus is coming back for us. And though sin may bother us in this life and we may be troubled in our mind because of our own failings, we can be assured that Jesus said, my little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not, and if any man sin. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. Our Sunday school is ended, and we will soon have church in here. Thanks for singing.